Back in October, I started a diet with a friend of mine who lives in North Carolina. Over the course of three months, I lost 20 pounds. I would tell you that the reason for my success was a daily calorie count or step goal or stair goal. And I did all of those things, but that's not why I succeeded. The reason why I succeeded was because of my friend who lives in North Carolina. Every day we would text each other about the meals that we were eating or the activities we were doing, and then every Tuesday we would have an official weigh-in. We would wake up each morning, each Tuesday morning, we'd go to our bathrooms, we take a picture of the number in between our toes, and we'd share with each other the weight that we were that day. We would show each other the progress that we were making. Then came the holidays. During the holidays, I didn't do so good. In fact, I've still got a bump on the back of my head from how hard I hit when I fell off the bandwagon. Then came the new year and there was no new resolution to get started. I stopped texting my friend. Either throughout the day, I stopped sharing with him my weight every Tuesday morning. I cut off that accountability. I've gained some of that weight back and now I've gotta be honest, I watched some of these videos that I'm sharing with you thinking, I need to go back on that diet. Why am I sharing all of this with you? It's because I wanna share with you that accountability is valuable and sometimes the lack of it can be very dangerous. Right now, we are all removed from the nucleus of our spiritual accountability. Because of the coronavirus, we are no longer meeting in anything above 10 people. We're no longer meeting as a church family. And because of that, there can be temptations and dangers that arise because of the isolation that we have. David experienced the same thing. And so I want to share with you some of the things that we can learn from his story in 2 Samuel chapter 11. 2 Samuel chapter 11 is a story about David in which he was supposed to be off at battle, but he chose to stay away from his army and at home. And these were the things that challenged him. Here's how the story begins. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. And David sent and inquired about the woman. And one said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? So David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. Now, she had been purifying herself from her uncleanness. Then she returned to her house, and the woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. I want to share with you three dangers that arose for David during this time of isolation for him. The first you find in verse 1. In verse 1, it says, In the spring of the year, the time was when kings would go to battle, David sent Joab. And then it says, but David remained in Jerusalem. The first thing that you see in David as he's separated from those who are supposed to be shouldering his spiritual, spirituality with him is that he has become spiritually lazy. He's not doing the things that he's supposed to be doing. He's supposed to be off at war. He's supposed to be with his army. But he's neglecting that responsibility. And instead, he has become spiritually lazy. The same thing can happen for us when we are not constantly meeting together and motivating each other to do what God has said and to, to be about the work that he has for Christians. It's very easy to just get caught up in the daily minutia, whatever it may be, whether it be chores or entertainment or whatever else, we can lose sight of the work that we need to be doing. The second thing that comes from David and his life as he's separated from his army is that temptations can strengthen. The story reveals how David was walking along the roof of his house and he looked down and he saw this woman bathing. Now that may have been a temptation at one point, but it's even stronger now that he's separated from the army and where he's supposed to be. 
Uriah the Hittite was one of David's mighty men. He was in that army. Can you imagine if David was actually with his army and he still saw Bathsheba? Do you think that he would be as tempted to sleep with Bathsheba if Uriah was standing right next to him? Probably not. But the point is that when you're by yourself, temptations can increase. So when we are quarantined at home, possibly even bored, what temptations are going to be increasing for you? The third thing that David experiences when he's isolated from his army is that truth starts to blur. David, when he finds out that Bathsheba is pregnant, he sends to the front, he tells Joab to send Uriah home. So Uriah comes back to David and he says, Uriah, you need to go home tonight. I don't know if David was trying to cover it up or if he thought that Uriah going home would simply validate that whatever child Bathsheba had, he would accept. But Uriah decides, I'm not going home. In fact, what he tells David is, the Ark of the Covenant is in the tent. All the armies are in tents. How can I go home and sleep with my wife? So David, the next part of his plan is, I'm going to get him slobbering drunk. Maybe then he'll go home to his wife. So he gets Uriah drunk, and even then, here's the interesting thing to me, is that even drunk, Uriah is more noble than King David. The last part of his plan, when he sees that Uriah will not go home and validate this child, is that he sends Uriah back to the front to have him killed. David is now deepening the hole. He's committed adultery. He's lying about it. He is uh, even going to commit murder. In this context, David can think of this plan because anything can sound good when it's simply rattling between your own ears. We can form an echo chamber in which things sound good, things sound wise when we're all by ourselves. So there's going to be a temptation to distort, to leave truth when we are alone and isolated from those spiritually accountable to us. So as we wrap up, I want to share with you some things that we need to think about in light of this quarantine and isolation. First is what spiritual responsibilities are you going to be tempted to neglect during this time of quarantine? The second question is, what temptations are going to strengthen for you when we're not meeting together and we're not encouraging each other? The third question is, what safeguards can we put in place to make sure that we are thinking rightly and biblically, even when we're alone and at home? The fourth question is, what can we do to maintain accountability even when we're not meeting together? This is going to be a test for all of us. This is going to be a time in which certain things about our spirituality are going to be tested. And so let's look to maintain that accountability. Let's make sure to maintain that connection. And let's address these spiritual dangers that can arise during this time of isolation.